On this episode of the Discover the Word podcast... Hold on a sec. I need to take this. Uh, Hello? Okay. Yeah, can I call you back? (laughs) Great. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I had to take that because answer the call. That's actually the title of our study this time on Discover the Word. So what kind of call are we talking about? Who's it from? How compelled do you feel to pick up and answer it before it goes to voicemail? All that will become clear in this episode's conversations on Discover the Word about answering the call. And it is great to have you here as we start another hour or so of studying the Bible together on Discover the Word, the small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries. Rasul Berry will be guiding the group's discussions as he and Elisa Morgan and Bill Crowder and Daniel Ryan Day talk about answering the call and specifically looking at the life of the Apostle Peter and several aspects of the call that he received. Now, obviously, Peter didn't have a phone, but he did get a call that changed his life. And so his call, your call, and answering the call, that's the direction we're headed here on Discover the Word. So let's get started. Rasul has a question for Elisa and Bill and Daniel that I think we all have a story for, I'm guessing. But let's hear what they have to say in response to this question. Have you ever had a phone call that changed your life? Oh, I see a, a big nod there, Elisa. <laughs> can you tell us about Well, there's some I can't talk about that changed my life. But the one that I will share is I had my hand on the old-fashioned receiver of a landline. Mm-hmm. And I was praying and I was getting ready to call an institution, a radio institution, to see if they would pick up the radio program I had been doing for Denver Seminary because they had cut it in their budget. And as I was praying, getting ready to make this phone call, the phone rang. And I picked it up. And it was a woman who was on the board of Mops International asking if I would be interested in applying to become their first president. Mm. And I never would have applied for anything to do with it. (laughs) But because in that moment, the question came, Mm. I did. And I served there 20 years. So whatever, go figure. What a call. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. For me, it wasn't a call that I received. It was a call that I made. Mm. I was very young as a pastor and when you're young you don't know what you don't know and now that I'm older I still don't know what I don't (laughs) know but (laughs) but uh, we had this new church that we had planted in my hometown we had about 140 or 150 people coming it was a nice little group of people still have a lot of friends from those days and um, we decided we wanted to have a bible conference and you know who who would come here you know that kind of thing well, you know, we distribute our daily bread and put it out there for people to get. We'll just call them and have them send somebody. Huh. So I called up here and I asked, could I speak to Mark DeHaan? <laughs> and uh, I expected to get like three secretaries and two personal attendants and stuff. And he answered the phone. This is Mark. I said, hi, I'm Bill. You don't know me. I pastor a little church up in a hollow in West Virginia. We'd like you to come and speak. What do you think? <laughs> and he was kind of like, well, how could I say no to an invitation like that? <laughs> <You know? So laughs> gracious. And we became oh. fast friends. And almost 30 years later, I ended up hmm. coming on staff of mm. Our wow. Daily Bread. Wow. And it goes back to that phone call mm. when he responded so kindly to my <laughs> invitation. <laughs> and I can think of positive ones, but the one that comes to mind and probably will forever now was when we were in the middle of a movie night as a family and the phone rang and it was finding out that our nephew had Mm -hmm. been airlifted to a hospital Mm -hmm. to have emergency brain surgery Mm because he had a tumor. I'll never forget those minutes, those hours, that night. That was a different kind of phone call. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can relate to the heaviness of sometimes the call. Like I remember very vividly, it was a couple months after my wife Tamika and I got married, and this was the first time that we were apart for a while. I had to mm. drive up to Philly to for some things, and so our, our daughter was with me in the car, and Tamika was at home, and I get a call from my mom, frantic, are you okay, are you okay? And I'm like, 
I'm fine. What's going on? She was like, there was some type of explosion at the Capitol building. And I was like, mom, I'm, I'm on the highway. This, you know, being a mom, I'm thinking she's like, just turn on the radio. And I turn on the radio and I hear about the 10 <sighs> hours and I hear about, <sighs> you know, the Pentagon. And I just remember now, like, I got to make sure my wife is OK. We're about a mile away. You know, we lived at the time from the Capitol building and and just how that information and that phone call, you know, mm-hmm. just kind of changed, your life. changed mm-hmm. our, you everybody's know, everybody's mm-hmm. life. Right. Mm-hmm. And so the call is a very personal thing. It can be. And then especially in scripture, calling has this sense of when God decides to move in the lives of ordinary people and speak into and really change their lives. And in a way that sometimes those phone calls can. And so we're going to look at specifically the extraordinary calling of Peter. Simon Peter is one of my favorite Mm -hmm. people in the Bible. And actually, other than Jesus, he's mentioned more than any other person in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And I think examining him will give us some great insight about the (laughs) roller coaster ride of the call. Mm -hmm. So what do we know about Simon Peter. He's a fisherman. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. And then want, I want to go to his personality. You know, he was yeah. a little headstrong. And yeah. He was. Uh, he was very human. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why he appeals to us so mm-hmm. much. And I don't know if it's why you like him so much, but I think one of the reasons we're attracted to him is it's so easy to find ourselves in him. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. He always speaks his mind mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for yeah, the I most think. part, right? Like he's pretty quick to say exactly what he's thinking. Yeah. He asks yeah. the hard questions. Which, he's, he's actually happy to say when he's not thinking. <laughs> like us. Right. Yeah. So there are a couple of different calling stories that we see, but we're going to look at Luke chapter five, which is really when the moment happens where, you know, he kind of makes this commitment and Jesus engages with him. So I want us to read Luke five, starting from verse one, and then we're going to go down to 11. So maybe Daniel, if you could read the first five verses and Bill, you can read verse sure. six and one. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Okay, so we see this picture being painted, but sometimes we have to kind of lean into more of the detail to kind of really draw out the drama, right? Mm -hmm. That's here in this text. So what do you first notice about when things start to change from Simon's regular day? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So kind of to your question, I picture Peter cleaning nets, pretty normal task, Mm -hmm. but a whole lot of people keep piling up on this (laughs) beach to the extent that this teacher guy gets in maybe his boat. Yes. He, just, he, <laughs> sits he down. doesn't even ask. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Peter's just sitting there working. And he's yeah. like, Jesus is like, oh, okay, I'll just get, go over here. Yeah. in the boat. And he's like, okay, <laughs> what's happening now? Might he have been annoyed or anything? I mean, he's trying to, trying to go home because it's not been very successful. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's the other thing. He's mm-hmm. probably not in a great mood. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's been working all night. Mm-hmm. He came up blanks. And yeah. all he wants to do is go home and get some breakfast and go to bed. Yeah. I mean, it's not hard to imagine not. that. And yeah. Jesus asks Simon to push the boat out a little bit. <laughs> Which so means that he can he's talk. stuck. <laughs> hey, <laughs> could you stop cleaning your nets for a second, please? Right. Um, and push your boat out that I'm sitting on yes. Yes. to teach people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very imposing. And that is the moment that changes everything when Jesus enters his boat. Mm. And I think about. Has Jesus ever gotten into your boat? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah. sure has. Oh, he sure yeah. has. You know, 
And I think about when he got into my boat, so to speak, I wasn't thinking about him. I was, you know, I didn't grow up in a Christian home, but right when I was about to start college, you know, I started like just the spirit started to show me my need for a savior. And Mm -hmm. I was about to start college. I had very different intentions for how my, you know, what I was going to partake in and experience. And then all of a sudden I'm like, Jesus, why are you getting in my boat right now? Like, Mm -hmm, you know, but it changed everything. So that's one level of intrusion. Mm -hmm. That's pretty big. He enters (laughs) this guy's boat when he's kind of shutting it down for the day, but he doesn't stop there. Mm -hmm. What's the next thing you see that he enters Mm -hmm. his world? Let's go fishing. (laughs) (laughs) And Peter is like, tired, discouraged, Mm -hmm. like, I just did that. Well, and you can almost imagine Peter sitting there thinking, okay, you're a rabbi. Mm -hmm. I'm a professional fisherman. Exactly. I I know how to do this. Everything you're telling me to do is wrong. Stay in your lane, bro. (laughs) (laughs) You know, this is like, and on top of that, just trammel fishing was the type that they did. So this wasn't a process of just kind of casting a line. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this was a net. This was throwing it over. This Very physical. This kind of drag. Yeah. So so this wasn't a small ask here. Mm-hmm. It was huge. And how does Peter's response reveal how big of a deal this was that he asked? Yeah. Well, I got to give him a little bit of credit because mm-hmm. it's a little kinder, <laughs> I think, than maybe I would have wanted to respond after fishing all night. Master... We've worked all night and caught nothing. Mm. So we could go fishing, but I just want you to know before we do that, that like we've already tried, but if you say so, okay, we'll, we'll do it. So what's so, the significance of him calling him master? Yeah. Is that well, because he's a rabbi? Well, master means captain of the boat. Oh. Mm. That's what the word means. Wow. Yeah. 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 This is oh. Peter's boat, but Jesus is, when Jesus steps in the boat, he becomes the captain of the boat. <laughs> <laughs> right. So how does that happen? Well, there is some aspect where mm-hmm. you see, one, Peter doesn't object to him getting mm-hmm. in the boat. And then two, even though he somewhat complains, mm-hmm. he does actually mm-hmm. obey this mm-hmm. very big ask. And so they bring up the fish and you see now the whole thing has changed. The whole world is going upside down for them. There's so much fish. The boat is sinking. You see the chaos that ensues. They're like, hey, James, John, get over here. We need your help. And they're pulling it in. And it's just you see the weight of it. And then you see the weight of Peter's response. Yeah. Forgive me. For I'm a sinful man, O oh Lord. And this is where you start to see what was maybe underneath that surface, that sense of arrogance yeah. of, wait a minute, who are you to tell me yeah. what to do? And I just want to think about Jesus's response to Simon's weightiness. He says, do not be afraid. Mm-hmm. From now on, you'll be catching men. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you see in Jesus's response to Peter? Well, telling him not to be afraid. I mean, Jesus says that to his disciples more than he says anything else, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, it almost seems like most of the time when he begins to say something to him, he starts off with, don't be afraid. Mm. We see that even after the resurrection where yeah. he, he says, peace, be still. It's okay. The, yeah. Things are going to be all right. Yeah, it reminds me of perfect love casts out fear. Yeah. And yeah. there's this way in which when Jesus comes to him before he gives him anything to do, He wants to let him know that he doesn't need to be afraid. Mm -hmm. And for us, so many times when God shows up, I mean, whether it's the phone call that I mentioned or Mm -hmm. any of the phone calls Mm -hmm. we mentioned, there's there's an aspect of fear there. What if they say no? What if the worst happens? What if this doesn't work out? What if I lose control? Yeah. And the Mm -hmm. first words out of Jesus' mouth Mm -hmm. to him are, do not be afraid. Mm -hmm. Peter thought that his awareness of his sinful condition should cause Jesus to depart from him. Mm -hmm. Jesus in response says, do not be afraid. I'm going to get closer to you Mm -hmm. and you're going to be joining me on mission. And that's what we'll see with the call that for all of us, there's a sense of fear, Mm -hmm. but then there's also this sense of God's presence that allows us to go deeper into a relationship with him and deeper into a sense of vision for what he would have for our life than we could ever imagine. So as we continue in the series on answering the call, specifically looking at the life of the Apostle Peter, one of the things that is a defining call for Peter is the call to confess. Mm. When you think of the word confess, yeah. what, what do you think of? I think first of sin. Mm-hmm. So like apologizing mm-hmm. to God for something. If we confess asking, our sins, he's yeah. faithful and just, yep. yeah. Yep. Mm. But then I also think of like confessions related to statements of faith or proclamations of belief or Mm -hmm. something like that too. So 
kind of the same thing because you're admitting to belief or struggle or whatever, but... Yeah, the word confess in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, the word confess means to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. Homologeo. Yeah, to agree. To agree, yeah. yeah. I go straight to sin. (laughs) That's where I go when you say the word confess. Right. But we know that there's a broader usage of the term Mm -hmm. we have. You know, the definition in its simplest is to acknowledge or avow by way of revelation to agree with. Mm -hmm. Confessions are not all the time accurate, you know, uh, fully in in what the person understands. It's just like I'm revealing to you what's in my inner world. So it can be either this recognition of sin and agreeing with God or it might be agreeing with somebody else. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And we'll see actually these two very different versions of confession in the same chapter. And these are pivotal moments in the life of Peter and, and in the Gospels. So if you can go with me to Matthew chapter 16, and if, Elisa, you could read from verse 13 to verse 18. Okay. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Mm. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Okay, so... (laughs) That always... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a whole lot there. Mm-hmm. Bill, we spoke earlier about the significance of where this is taking mm-hmm. place. Yeah. Help us understand the significance. Well, uh, you and I agreed that it's one of our favorite places to go in the Bible lands. Caesarea Philippi is at the base of Mount Hermon, which is in the extreme north of Israel. Out of Mount Hermon come the headwaters of the Jordan River and right at Caesarea Philippi. But in the first century, Caesarea Philippi was kind of a Roman outpost for R&R, for Roman soldiers, so they could get away from all the pressure and the religious stringencies of Jerusalem, and they could have a place where it was a little bit like a taste of home. They had Roman-style food and Roman-style everything, including Roman-style religion. At the base of Mount Hermon at Caesarea Philippi, there's a cliff with niches carved in the cliff face where they would have all the little gods. And there was a temple to Diana off to the side. And there's a big grotto, like the grottos of Pan. Uh, Some people refer to it as Banias or Panias. But that's where Jesus took them (laughs) to ask this one question. It's interesting. The first time we went to Caesarea Philippi, It was a 45-minute drive in a luxury bus. It would have taken them probably a day and a half to walk there. Jesus asks them this one question, then he turns around and walks them back. (laughs) So there's something about this location that's really critical to what Jesus is doing. Yeah, this is contested space, you could say. There are literally many options of deities that are being kind of contended as the Hmm. gods to worship where Jesus intentionally takes them to. And it's not just random gods. I mean, these are the Roman occupiers who are their oppressors. They are the ones in the power. And it's in this place that he asked the question, who do men say that I am? And then who do you say that I am? Hmm. What do you notice in Jesus's response to Peter's confession here? That it didn't come from Peter. Mm. He says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven has revealed it to you. And, yeah. and then there is a confession, using that word <laughs> and in a different way, like you're suggesting, of who Peter is. Yes. So Peter confesses who Jesus is, and then Jesus confesses who Peter is. Right. Yeah. And then we also see this, you know, we've been going back and forth between the name Simon and the name uh, Peter, and it's because... His name, you know, as we would say, his government name <laughs> would have been Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, mm-hmm. son of Jonah. Mm-hmm. And Jesus explicitly references 
his name of birth and then says, OK, and now you're not, you're going to be Peter. You are Peter, mm-hmm. which means rock. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. But the other thing I notice here is the extravagant celebration of Jesus's. You know, he's mm-hmm. like, Peter, you nailed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, he goes in. Blessed are you. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. The gates of hell will not. I mean, yeah. prevail. He really. Yeah, it was big time. It's, mm-hmm. it's significant. And it's just incredible moment. And of course, I also notice Peter's the one that speaks. You know, for mm-hmm. the disciples, yeah. right? He's the one that, that says it. So it's interesting, Rasul, when Jesus asks the question, who are the people saying? It's almost like he's doing a CNN poll or something. <laughs> you know, you're out there among the people. What are you hearing? What are the kind of things they're saying? And because the crowds are Jewish crowds, you get very Jewish answers. Mm-hmm. Right. But they're in a Roman place, and so the backdrop of the gods is very Roman God. So you have the Jewish answers, and you have the Roman answers to who are we supposed to follow. Right. And then Jesus says, okay, now where are you? And what is the significance of this confession to those around Peter and to us today? I mean, first of all, it's one of the clearest statements Mm -hmm. about who Jesus was in almost all the gospels Mm -hmm. that pulls the whole story of the Bible together. You are the Messiah. You're the fulfillment of the old Testament. You're the son of God who was there at the beginning and helped create the world of the living God. Who's still living right now. So it's like a full statement. Yeah. Um, Probably the only one that surpasses it is Martha in John 11, mm -hmm. when she says all of that. And then she has the one who was to come, Mm -hmm. uh, the promised one. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he completely nails it. And so he's on cloud nine. Everything's yeah. all great. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes, as they say, life comes at you fast. <laughs> and your greatest strength can also be your greatest weakness. Let's now, Bill, if you could read verses 21 to 23. Sure. From that time, Jesus Christ began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. (laughs) I I think that's such an interesting (laughs) sentence. (laughs) Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you're not setting your mind on God's interests, but on man's. Wow. Wow. From the height to the depth. Yeah. From the (laughs) height. Talk about a smackdown. Yeah. Yeah. There's some pretty fascinating parts of this. First, that Peter takes him aside, mm. which we've talked about how in an honor-shame culture to ask a question out loud in front of others is to try to dishonor someone mm. or to pull honor yeah. away from them. Yeah. But yeah. when you ask them in private, mm-hmm. it's to genuinely have a conversation that doesn't get into an honor-shame contest. And so in that way, I think Peter's doing what's right, right? Like we, okay. we should have this conversation, just the two of us. And then also just the word Satan or Satan here throughout the Old Testament, we have this picture of this one who comes before God, like in the book of Job and presents, well, of course, Job follows you because you've done everything well for him. And so kind of this accusatory voice. And so we have Peter as the representative of that voice Mm. in this story, which is pretty fascinating. And that voice usually represents the opposite of what God's trying to do. Because just a few moments ago, Peter was the representative of God's voice in the story. And now he's the representative of the enemy's voice. One of the things I find interesting about this, Rasul, is that when you get to Matthew 16, you're kind of at the midpoint of Jesus's ministry. And after the Caesarea Philippi thing, this is the first time Jesus has spoken about his true mission. This is the first time he tells him what he's actually here to do. And I think it it almost seems as though the first half of his ministry is to reveal to his disciples who he is. That just God answered, you're the Christ, the Son Mm -hmm. of the living God. Now the rest of his ministry is preparing them for why he came, and that's the cross and the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so... In the same moments, right? We go from Simon Barjona to Peter Uh to Satan, get behind me. Yeah. You know, pretty extreme. And and so some could look at that as an overreaction, right? I mean, well, Uh first, the idea, like you said, that stops you in your tracks. Peter rebukes Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Like, hey, who does that? I don't know if you had your quiet (laughs) time today, like if you're a little (laughs) off, but. And it's important to note part of the idea is that his version of a Messiah 
was not going to suffer and die. Yeah. Maybe mm-hmm. he's thinking Jesus is suffering some doubt or some yeah. fears or whatever. But nonetheless, why do you think Jesus responds so strongly? Well, he explains why he responds strongly. He says, because you're setting your mind not on God's interests, but on men's interests. Men's interests, like you say, was for the kingdom of Israel to be restored and set free from Roman oppression. That was men's interest. God's interest was to redeem the world through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And there's such a disparity between what God's purposes are and what men's purposes were that Jesus needs to really, I think, very boldly challenge Peter's thinking in that. And it's interesting as the verses go on that it becomes very inclusive. You know, Mm -hmm. Jesus is making it clear this isn't just a Jesus and Peter issue. It's a Jesus and all of his followers issue. And Jesus says, you are a stumbling block to me. Matthew 4, Jesus is brought out into the wilderness and This accuser, Satan, shows up and offers Jesus so many other alternatives to dying. And here's Peter representing that same voice. Mm -hmm. And so here's, instead of the three temptations, now Jesus, here's the fourth temptation for Jesus. someone within his circle. So we see here two different types of confessions. Mm -hmm. One that agrees with God, Mm -hmm. you know, about the Mm -hmm. nature of who Jesus is, and one that agrees with Satan, Mm -hmm. the enemy. Mm -hmm. And we see in the same person can actually sometimes agree with either depending on the moment and our our perspective. Mm -hmm. And so uh, fortunately, this isn't the end of the story and we'll be able to pick up on the next chapter next time. Yeah, I think it's safe to say that how Peter responded to Jesus' call was at times bumpy. And the next chapter didn't start out a whole lot better. Uh, Peter, was he all in? Answering yes to the call? Absolutely. Except there were times when it seemed like maybe he wasn't. And in that next chapter of Peter's story, as Rasul promised, we'll be talking about an even bigger failure. Bigger even than thinking he could rebuke Jesus and bigger than get behind me Satan? Well, actually, yes, Peter's worst day. When our series Answer the Call continues after a quick timeout. Discover the Word is a Bible engagement resource from Our Daily Bread Ministries. And as we're digging into the life of Peter in this episode, I'd also like to point you toward another resource that I think will add a layer of depth to our conversations. It's a video series called In Pursuit of Peter, and it traces the life of Peter, an uneducated fisherman working on the Sea of Galilee, who was called by Jesus. And then this video follows how that call takes Peter to Jerusalem and Rome and a number of locations around the Mediterranean. There are six 20 or so minute episodes that are available on YouTube. And I would invite you to watch this travelogue style documentary that explores the amazing life of this disciple changed by the way he answered Jesus call. Now let me give you a link that'll take you to In Pursuit of Peter. The special link is go.odb for Our Daily Bread, go.odb.org slash Peter. That's simple enough. All lowercase, go.odb.org slash Peter. And now let's continue our journey through the life of Peter and discover what had to have been Peter's worst day and how Jesus' response to Peter included a holy reset button. Okay, so we've been going through this journey of answering the call with the Apostle Peter. And now we're going to look at one of the most famous moments in Peter's life, or maybe we should say infamous. Yeah. So let me ask you, like, have you ever experienced a betrayal? Yep. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yeah. (laughs) How does that make you feel? Oh, it is so painful. Yeah. It's devastating. It's because it was somebody you thought was Mm -hmm. with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you find out they're against you. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's really hard. Mm-hmm. Michael Card, the Christian musician, wrote, Only a friend can betray a friend. A stranger has nothing to gain. And only a friend gets close enough to ever cause that much pain. Amen. And uh, that's what I think of when I think of mm-hmm. times when I've been betrayed. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. One of the key aspects of it is a different expectation. Like an enemy can't really betray you because you already understand you're on opposite sides. But when someone who you know, who you love, who you thought y'all were close, 
decides to undermine, to talk mm-hmm. about you behind your back and things mm-hmm. like that. It just, it's gut wrenching. Mm-hmm. Especially when it is a really big surprise. Like every once in a while you're in a relationship and like it slowly deteriorates over time and then you get betrayed by that person and you're like, it still hurts, but you kind of saw it coming. Mm-hmm. The worst is when mm-hmm. you're out totally of nowhere blindsided. you're completely yeah. blindsided mm-hmm. and then you realize, wait, in order for them to do this, yeah. huh? these are all the conversations over this period of time that they've been having that I don't know about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's a whole different. And level. then there's the element too of when it's family, mm-hmm. you know, a marriage betrayal, okay, a child betrayal, mm-hmm. a parent betrayal. I mean, those are so life shaping, identity yeah. forming. Yeah. So any an examination of the life of Peter must include the lowest moment of his life. And we know this because it's an event that all four gospel writers include. And we're going to look at the version in Mark of Peter's betrayal. Now, I think there's something unique and interesting. What do we know about Mark as a gospel writer and where he Uh got some of his source material from? Uh, Peter was his source. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Peter viewed Mark much in the same way as Paul viewed Timothy. He Mm. refers to him as my own son. Mm. And like you say, a lot of scholars think that Mm -hmm. Peter was the primary source material for Mark's gospel. Mm. That to me shapes everything that we're going to read in terms of understanding the level of depth and Mm -hmm. honesty that these aren't folks talking about Peter but this is even you know our best understanding is him talking about himself well especially just because to know this whole story Peter's the only character that shows up in every piece of the story right so in order for this betrayal to be truly known to this extent it would have to be Peter being the one that shared it yeah so Daniel could you read Mark 14 verses 66 through 72 Sure. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. Then after a little while... The bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. What's really interesting is I think in Luke's account of it, it says that after that third denial, it says the Lord turned and looked at mm-hmm. Peter and... Oh, yeah. I know. Well, yeah, it just chokes you up just <laughs> oh. to think about the eye contact, mm-hmm. the, the sense of mm-hmm. being confronted with seeing the person you're betraying right after mm-hmm. you did it. And the thing that's interesting is that I don't separate the highlights of Simon Peter's life, the, the bold confession, from the shortcomings in some sense. Because sometimes our greatest strength can be our source of our most glaring weakness, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. And in Simon Peter's case, we can see some sense of overconfidence. Oh, because he says, oh, I would never, I mean, Jesus says, you're going to deny me. Right, because if uh, if we rewind a little bit, we started in verse 66. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. But if you go a little bit earlier to verse 26, we see some interesting dialogue take place when Jesus tries to give them a heads up of the difficulty that is coming. Can anybody pick that up? Verse Mm -hmm. 26, verses 26 through 31. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. I mean, could you imagine being like, you know, John or Thomas and being like, look, Lord, they might betray you, but I'm not. Yeah, I'm your guy. I'm your guy, right? Yeah. Now, let me just jump in here a minute because we started off talking about betrayals. Yeah. And when we think of betrayal, we usually think of Judas right. and denial, Peter. So hmm. you're kind of making them a little bit more synonymous 
Yeah, I actually think in a sense, a denial was a sense of a, of mm-hmm. a betrayal. Yeah. But what we also see is the reason why betrayals are more permanent. Okay. And we're going to kind of turn the corner mm-hmm. in a mm-hmm. moment to see that fortunately, this wasn't the end of that story. And I think what happens next actually reveals why we call it a denial and not a kind of more long lasting betrayal. Yeah. But okay. I think I that's know. a good point. And I'm, as I'm reading this, I was struck by the last verse or the last sentence in, in verse 31. And all the others said the same. Yeah. Everybody mm-hmm. said, I will not. But everybody scattered. Yeah. You know, Peter's the one we really pull out. I mean, we kind of know other people left, but they all. Yeah, yeah. he was the one that's recorded as being verbal. Mm-hmm. He's the one who actually said, I never knew him. Right. But the others just ran and hid. Ran. Right. But yeah. they said they wouldn't, yeah. just like he did. You know, and there's a whole mm-hmm. lot of things that we could pull out between yeah. not just overconfidence, but his fatigue. Um, the disconnection mm-hmm. from Jesus and his mission that were all precursors to this moment of failure. Mm-hmm. And that's important because sometimes we can be in those same places, you know, yeah. where mm-hmm. we can see the warning signs. Maybe his consistency in speaking out loud or thinking out loud, yeah. which some of us can mm-hmm. experience mm-hmm. or being the first one, just like we talked about in our last conversation, the first one to say something. Mm-hmm. And so there's something to that extent too. Sounds like all of them were thinking it. Peter just said it. Right. You know, Jesus mm-hmm. has made it clear in some way that he's something of yeah. a leader. Mm-hmm. And when you were given that responsibility, you want to lead. <laughs> yeah. so. I, I wonder too, given our last conversation, Russell, do you see a link between Peter saying to the Lord, no, this is not going to happen to you. Yes. And now his uh, denials. Okay. Absolutely. Oh. Yeah. I think that he was relying on his own perspective mm-hmm. on what should happen and not connected to the mission of Jesus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that moment of weeping bitterly, and again, just remembering that mm-hmm. he's the one that gave those words to Mark draws it out. But fortunately, this is not the end of the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We can turn to John chapter 21. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the things that to me is, is so pivotal in terms of a contrast between Judas and Peter is how do we respond when we fall short? How do we yeah. respond when that happens? And so just to kind of set it up, we know that he goes back fishing. Yeah. Back to where he started from. This is what I'm going to do. And the guys decide to go with him. Because he is a leader. Because he's, he's a, a leader. Mm-hmm. Right. And then all of a sudden, they hear this voice telling them to put the net over the side of the boat, just like they did in the beginning in Luke 5. And they see the fish. And all of a sudden, Peter says, it's the Lord. Then Jesus cooks the fish. And that's where we kind of end up in verse 15. So they've had this reunion Mm -hmm. of sort. First Mm -hmm. time seeing each other since and having a chance to have a conversation, really. And Bill, can you read verse 15? Sure. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So what do you notice about this interaction between Peter and Jesus? Well, the first thing I noticed as I was reading it is that John, the narrator, keeps referring to Peter as Peter, but Jesus is using his pre-Peter name of Simon. Mm. I noticed that too. It's almost like he takes back or he refers to the pre-confessing Peter. Mm. Hmm. That is interesting. And it's like, well, is that because he's reverted back to his earlier self or I don't know, maybe he's stripping it back down to the beginning to build it back up. Starting over. Mm Starting over. Anything else you notice? Yeah, well, I mean, definitely the three betrayals are matched by three opportunities Mm -hmm. to make it right as much as you can in a situation like that. And so there's a a healing aspect to Jesus asking the questions that many times. Mm. He wants to get Peter's attention to know, 
yeah, I know what happened, but this is a, a new mm-hmm. start, a yeah. new birth, a new moving forward. Um, There's a restorative bit to yeah. it. He was the leader. He had forfeited that privilege to some degree by his denials of Jesus. And now Jesus is like, okay, you still got to shepherd my sheep. You still got to tend my lambs. You still got to feed my sheep. Before he told him, you're a fisherman, you're going to fish for men. Now he's saying, you were a fisherman. Now you're going to be a shepherd. Yeah. Mm. And then the part that gives me chills. Then he said to him, follow me. (laughs) He repeats the very first thing that he says in the same space Mm. in the Lake of Gennesaret or Sea of Galilee. And Mm. what that says about the holy reset button Mm. that we have, you know, in Jesus where he's like, I know you messed up. You messed up bad Mm -hmm. in a way that you never thought possible. Mm -hmm. And yet I hear in, in Peter's response a humility that wasn't there before, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I'm not loving you more than everybody else. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to do. He's just like, Lord, you know all things. Yeah. I, I, you even know me better than I know myself. Mm. And there's something about that level of confession and Jesus's response of follow me that gives as good news to all of us who've also mm-hmm. fallen short, who've also in our overconfidence or isolation, our disconnection from Jesus, gone places that we never thought we would. And Jesus still says to us, follow me. Yeah, Peter's journey in answering Jesus' call was not without its stumbles along the way, big stumbles. But I love that term, the holy reset button, and that Jesus still says, follow me. But does it get more difficult to answer the call, you think, after we fail, after we fail big time? Well, as we continue, we'll see what Peter did with his extra chance. Maybe that holy reset button is a first step. But still, how do you answer the call to follow after that big a failure? How do you come back from that? Could Peter? We'll find out in the next part of our study called Answer the Call. Okay. We've been talking about answering the call through the life of Peter. In this conversation, we're going to look at answering the call to call others. And it's, to me, one of my favorite parts of the life of Peter, because I love a great comeback story. Yeah. <laughs> Do y'all like comeback stories? Oh, yeah. Do you have any favorite comeback stories? Mm-hmm. I grew up in West Virginia, and there are only two major schools in West Virginia, West Virginia University and Marshall University. And Marshall gave us Randy Moss and a bunch of other guys, Byron Left, which, but they also gave us Chad Pennington, who was a quarterback for Marshall. And he's the only guy in NFL history to win NFL Comeback Player of the Year twice. Mm. (laughs) He had two comebacks. Yeah, he had two Mm. comebacks from really severe leg injuries. So I like Chad Pennington. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) It was 2007. In the fall, oh. <laughs> Appalachian State University oh. in the big house playing Michigan. Looks like Michigan's going to do what all the big schools do, take the lead, and then it'll just be smooth sailing for them. Is that what happens? No. The greatest <laughs> upset in college football history, Appalachian State versus Michigan. I love it. Okay, okay, yeah. Appalachian State grad. Pipe <laughs> 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 right down. You know, I'm thinking about some of the most respected pastors mm. who fell for some reason and were discipled by Jesus mm. back into ministry. And I don't really want to bring up their names because that sure. brings up their yeah. fall. Right. Um, but there are many, and I really respect yeah. you know, the process they've been through. Yeah, but it's almost become proverbial to think about how many times Abraham Lincoln failed <laughs> Lost before elections. he got elected yeah. president. I well, mean, you know, one of the great comebacks of all time that we're, we're going to look at, we last talked about the epic failure of Peter denying Jesus three times after promising and assuring Jesus that he would never do something like that. And we saw a restoration of relationship, but that still doesn't answer the question of like, well, what happened next? And we get to see that really the Lake of Gennesaret, even though it's the end of the Gospel of John, is really the beginning of Peter's comeback story. And the book of Acts tells us the story of what happens next. And Peter's right there in the mix. 
So we're going to look at chapter two, but just to set it up in chapter one, we see Jesus right before his ascension to heaven, giving them the command, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And that witness is really to be a proclaimer in the way that Peter had failed to do just about 50 days earlier. And what we see next is one of the most inspiring transformations in the scripture. And so we get to see Peter publicly communicate for the first time since his failure. So if you could, uh, Elisa, just read Acts chapter two, you can start in verse 14 and go down to 18. And then, Bill, if you could go 19 to 24. Okay. But Peter, standing with the eleven lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams." Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Okay. What happened? What's different <laughs> about Peter than when we last saw him at one? He's filled with the Spirit. Yeah. yeah. That's a big difference, right? Yeah. It, there's a way in which in the whole falling and restoration, and this is symbolic for all of us, Peter himself was crucified mm. and raised. You know, mm-hmm. th- And that's what happens in these, we symbolize it through baptism. You know, we, we go into Christ's death and come up in newness of life. And he's not apologizing for Jesus is being crucified. He's not uncomfortable with the cross. He understands the death. He holds it. He embraces it. He He's there mm-hmm. and he's experienced it. Yeah. And he's making a bunch of connections to the Old Testament. And he's saying things not just with confidence, but with a clarity. That same authority that Jesus had is like passed on to Peter through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he's like making these connections and speaking with authority and addressing questions that people have and all that. You think about Luke 24, after the resurrection, when Jesus meets the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and has the greatest small group Bible study (laughs) ever held in the history of the world. As Jesus, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, begins to reveal to them all the things that were pointing to him. And you kind of have to wonder, hearing this untrained, uneducated fisherman doing this kind of level of biblical scholarship, you kind of have to wonder if during the 40 days before Jesus ascended, if he had those kinds of Bible studies with his disciples that helped him to be able to make all those connections you're talking about, Daniel. Absolutely. You know, Jesus had said in Luke 24 that all the law and the prophets point to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the fascinating thing is that Peter is now publicly, boldly proclaiming the exact thing he rebuked Jesus for. Yes, you know, exactly. And just in a few weeks. And so it is amazing. And that's part of the reason why it's important for us to read the text is because this moment that he references from the prophet Joel, he says, has now been fulfilled. Mm-hmm. There's a new era of humanity that has just been unleashed that Peter is riding this wave of. The other part that I wanted to kind of lean into is, do you notice a difference? And we look at verse 22 to 24 between maybe the fear that was characterizing his interaction mm-hmm. with the servant girl and what he says now. Yeah, I mean, he's really on the offensive here. He was playing defense mm-hmm. uh, in the courtyard of the high priest, but now he's on offense. Right. Mm-hmm. And and yeah. he's on offense boldly declaring 
things that undoubtedly those people did not want to hear. I mean, he wants to be told, you did right. this. You put him to death. Yeah, you used ungodly Roman hands to do it, but it's on you. Right. And uh, I mean, he doesn't exactly pull his punches. Right. And it's interesting too, one of the phrases that I've kind of held on to for a long time that I learned was to be unclear is to be unkind. And Peter's very clear throughout this whole thing. And the result of that clarity in verse 37 is when they heard this, they didn't want to kill Peter. They didn't throw stones at him. They didn't question him, whatever. They were cut to the heart Mm -hmm. and convicted. Mm -hmm. And for this moment, we see this very clear proclamation of who Jesus was and what that means for them with the boldness of you were a part of that death. And yet their response is conviction and a desire to turn. And as a result, of course, Mm -hmm. the church is birthed in a very real and amazing way. Yeah, and verse 41 tells us that those who received his word and were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So we see the impact. And of course, this is the day of Pentecost. And what, what do we know about what that phrase meant and why there were that many people even outside? It was the second of the spring feasts. There were seven Jewish festivals throughout the year usually connected to the agrarian calendar, and three of them, two in the spring and one in the fall, Jews were required to come to the place of worship together as a people to worship and celebrate. The first was Passover. That's when Jesus was killed. This is Pentecost, Penta 50 days later, but it's also called the Feast of First Fruits. It's the early harvest, celebrating God's provision again for them. And so in the same way that we see the sacrifice system as a foreshadowing or a type of the sacrifice of Jesus, we also see this harvest Mm -hmm. that was being celebrated as a foretaste of this harvest of the age of the church. And just to circle back about the comeback, because it would have been really easy for Peter to be embarrassed Mm -hmm. by his failure and say, you know what, I'm glad that I'm good with Jesus now, but I'm just going to, you know, retreat. Yeah, John, from why don't life. you take this one? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, in some ways, you can even say I'm the least qualified because they could say, hey, buddy, you were the guy that said you didn't even know him. You <laughs> yeah. know, and it would have been easy for him to retreat. But instead, he moved forward and received that call to call others. And I think that that's at different times. All of us have had that hesitancy, you know, to say, do I really want to put myself out there? Do I really want to share my faith? Do I really want to proclaim what God has done? Because what does that say about me? We are all imperfect messengers Mm -hmm. proclaiming Mm -hmm. a perfect God. Mm -hmm. And that's always going to be your intention. That's right. So the blessing is that Peter answered the call to call others. And he gives us a model and inspiration that we can do the same thing even when we've fallen short. I don't think any of us would want our whole life to be judged and evaluated on the basis of our worst day. And when Peter denied Jesus, that was his worst day. But as we see in Acts, that was not the end of Peter's story. What he did with the opportunity Jesus gave him with the holy reset button is an encouragement to us all, isn't it? Well, you're listening to Discover the Word, and uh, in the concluding segment of this study, we're going to fast forward 30 years. A lot happens in 30 years of life, doesn't it? I mean, think back about what you were doing 30 years ago. And if not old enough to go back that far, think back 20 or 10 years ago. All those life experiences in those years have shaped you into who you are today, haven't they? Well, why that's an important perspective to keep in mind as we wrap up our focus on the life of Peter after we take 60 seconds to give you a heads up as to where the group goes for our next study on the Discover the Word podcast. Next time on the Discover the Word podcast. What comes to mind when you hear the phrase, be a good Samaritan? Elisa Morgan leads some conversations with Marty Hahn and Bill Crowder about a famous story Jesus told. I've heard the phrase used in news reports or whatever, you know, and a good Samaritan Mm -hmm. stopped or a good Samaritan came forward. And it's interesting because Mm -hmm. it's a phrase that comes from scripture and it's very old, if you will, and yet it has a current meaning. The series is called Me and My Neighbor, and we're gonna look at the parable of the, quote, 
good Samaritan, where this phrase is actually coined from. Yeah, what Jesus' parable about a good Samaritan said to the people he told it to, and what it says to us today, is what we'll be exploring together in the next Discover the Word podcast. Okay, so 30 years. That's about how much time elapsed between the Peter we read about in the book of Acts and the Peter who writes a couple of letters that are included in our New Testament. And Rasul wants that thought to guide us through this last segment of our study, Answer the Call. You know, one of the things that has struck me as we've been going through the life of Peter is that because there is only a few pages between the Gospels and First Peter, we can forget that there were about 30 years that elapsed between when we see him and even in Acts, you know, doing this proclamation that we just spoke about versus, you know, the older statesman leader of the church that we see toward the end of his life. So I want to kind of take a trip down memory lane, right, to kind of just remember the the gap and the, the space. So if you think about your teens or your 20s, what's one thing that you kind of look back on and express <laughs> gratitude for your growth? <laughs> Well, I'm not sure I would look at it as express gratitude for my growth. There are some things I look back from my childhood days that I'm sorry I'm still able to remember them. Mm. Uh, it's more a matter of regret than I've kind of grown beyond that. Mm. But I hear what you're saying. That's a very noble <laughs> thing you're offering. <laughs> well, I have similar regret, but I have some horrible stories. <laughs> and I'll just share one of them. Yeah, right after I took this role to lead a nonprofit, We had an invitation to go to a downtown law firm who needed to get rid of some office furniture and we could pick some stuff out for free. So the office manager had come with me and I was like 34 and she was like, "Hmm, we'll just say 65 to 70. And as we were leaving to return to the office, she said, could I follow you back in my car? Because I'm not exactly sure I know the way. And I said, sure. She said, well, I need to stop into the restroom. Would you wait for me? And I said, no. (laughs) Y'all, I said, no. And she followed me back. And I was like, what's wrong with you, Elisa? And I am grateful, Bill, that the Lord taught me how incredibly impatient Hmm. and stupid I can be at times. (laughs) Oh, man. It's an awful story. Yeah, there's lots of things, I think, if I look back on Mm. my teen years. I mean, I'm thankful I met my wife in high school Mm -hmm. and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. But she and I joke around often about... The Daniel that she Mm. dated in high school and the one she's married to now are pretty different people in a lot of mostly better ways, (laughs) I think. And one of those was just, I was really intense about what I believed about who God was and how God worked in the world. I had all the answers. (laughs) And over time, just realizing how little I knew or the things that I held on to as gospel truth that Mm. I found out... weren't in the gospel (laughs) or whatever. (laughs) And even just the way that those things that I've become confident of now, I hold just in a much different way most of the time, Mm. some of the time. (laughs) Yeah, I think for me, I grew up as a Christian. I mean, I became a Christian at age 21. And I grew up in a very ultra, ultra, ultra conservative type kind of restrictive view of who was really a Christian and who really wasn't Mm. and stuff like that. And one of the greatest benefits that the Lord has given me over the years is letting me travel internationally and experience how much bigger the body of Christ Mm. is than I ever dreamed possible Mm. before. I mean, I still think it's not quite as big as some people try to make it, but it's so much bigger than I ever imagined. And and I'm thankful for the Lord letting me learn that. Thank you all for sharing just the perspectives of time. I think about myself and how much I had to grow to not see myself just through the eyes of others mm, and yeah. just accept Absolutely. myself for mm-hmm. who I was and, mm-hmm. and, and really appreciate who God made me. Right. Mm-hmm. And um, that's one thing that we really get to see in Peter's life, you know, because by the time we get to first Peter, he's no longer 
a young, impulsive man. And sometimes, like, when I go home with family, they it feels like I'm in a time warp. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. they just still see me as you the 10-year-old. We go back to original roles. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I go back and they still call me Billy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. And right. that's what I was until I was in high school, but that's what I still get called at home. Yeah, and I'll always be the one that forgot his shoes when he was in sixth yep. grade and just, for you know. And and I think we do that with Peter sometimes, mm. is, is we kind of freeze him in the Gospels and forget that he mm-hmm. he grew and he developed. And in fact, one of the cool things is when you read First and Second Peter through the lens of that growth, you start to see some really cool echoes mm-hmm. of things that he discovered. Mm-hmm. So I want to go there in this last session on Peter as we check in on him and his, you know, later in life, particularly in First Peter chapter five. So, uh, Elisa, could you read verses one through five and then Daniel read six through eleven? To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourself to the elders, all of you. Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. All right, I'm going to pause there real quick. What are some immediate things that you read and go, wait, this sounds like something. Yeah, it sounds like what Jesus was saying to him there at the Sea of Galilee when he said, shepherd my sheep, feed my flock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Feed my lambs. Yeah, Yeah, it's like a direct callback. Now he's using the same language, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, just the experience that he's speaking from now. You know, I mean, he calls himself an elder. So he's older, (laughs) right? (laughs) Right, literally. And out of that older experience, there's just wisdom for younger shepherds Mm -hmm. you know even something as simple as don't do it for your own gain and And things like that and i even hear a reflection of judas Mm -hmm. you know remember he was over the money he sold out jesus for money don't you know like i can just see him having flashbacks of his of his life through the years Mm. of his experience as Mm -hmm. he's writing this one of the things we've talked about a few times is when you see peter in the gospels there's this perceived arrogance there like Mm -hmm in Matthew 16 when he actually takes it upon himself to rebuke Jesus. Yes. But here he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Yeah. Knowing what we know about Peter, we know this is not a platitude that he just decided to pull out from Proverbs, though it's there. But this is an understanding that he has Mm -hmm. because he had to be resisted when he said to Jesus, oh, they might deny you, but I never will. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he got grace when he's yeah. at yeah, the There's lake some of autobiography to yeah. this. Yeah. Okay, well, let's continue with verse six. Mm-hmm. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him steadfast in your faith. For you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And he, what, again, same question. What do you see as some imagery about how Peter talks about leadership as he talks about following that might sound similar to what we've learned about him over the last few conversations? Well, in Luke 22, as Jesus warns Peter about the fact that he's going to deny him, and Peter says, no, I won't, Jesus says to him, Satan has asked for and received permission mm. to sift you like mm. wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith won't fail. And here he's talking about your adversary, the devil, wants to consume you. So there seems to be a pretty good connection there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's really good. Yep. I mean, one of my favorite verses in all the Bibles in this passage of cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if Peter thinks back over some of those mistake moments in his life and realizes he was operating out of fear and stress and anxiousness. And realizing how much better things could have been if he had just trusted that Jesus would carry that anxiety for him. Yeah. Yeah. That anxiety would be great. That anxiety to maybe even prove 
fact that he didn't make a mistake when he dropped those nets in his dad's business and decided to, you know, follow Jesus. And But then also look at that, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time mm-hmm. yeah. he may exalt you. I think about when the disciples were arguing about who's the greatest in the yeah, kingdom yeah. and yeah. who mm-hmm. should, you know, be the one that lead. And, and he's like, look, God will exalt you. You don't have to try to exalt yourself in that way. Um, and then the way it ends, and the God of all grace, yes, who's called you to his eternal glory, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you <sighs> and make you strong. And that's exactly, I mean, Peter suffered, you know, after his denial of Christ. He suffered, and God restores him. Restore, confirm, mm-hmm. strengthen, and establish. Yeah. yeah. And that's exactly what we see at the end mm-hmm. of his life. And what do you think that can mean for us as we think about growth in answering the call? Yeah, I think about where it talks about God is the one who establishes our steps. Yeah, It's okay to plan our way. It's okay to try to figure out what, what's going on or whatever. But at the end of the day, it's God who directs. It's God who establishes our steps. And so that's one way that we can cast our anxiety on him when we don't know what to do or we're confused or whatever. We can trust that he's there to establish our steps in that way. That's good, Daniel. One of the first books that I read as a young Christian in my 20s was a book written by, I think, Erwin Lutzer, Hmm. uh, who for years was pastor of the Moody Church in Chicago. And it was entitled Failure, the Back Door to Success. Mm -hmm, (laughs) mm -hmm. And just how God can take our worst moments and turn them upside down Mm -hmm. and use it to equip us for better moments. Mm -hmm. And I think Peter really exemplifies that in a beautiful way. And yet, as much as he's dependent on the Lord, and he totally is, you see it, there's also an intentionality. Mm. You know, stand firm, resist the Mm -hmm. evil one, pay attention, be sober-minded, you know, these things. And and I tell you what, when people ask me if they can use the restroom, I say, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, we can all look back on those moments of our lives growing up and sometimes when people say I don't have any regrets I'm like really (laughs) I got a a bunch that I can think back on but there's two kind of paths that one can take and and one is to be like another famous Peter Peter Pan the boy who never grew up (laughs) um, and just stayed in a cycle of perpetual adolescence and that just is a lack of maturity yeah. Or you can be like the Apostle Peter who sees the value and can look back on his life and share lessons as an elder and say, hey, learn from me. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God because in due season he will exalt you. And that's just a lesson that he learned from life. It's a lesson he learned from Jesus. And it's a lesson now that he gives to us. Yeah, we can learn a lot from Peter about answering the call because that call from Jesus to follow him then has other related calls along the way. And as we saw for Peter, we shouldn't expect it to be a smooth or perfect ride without both successes and failures along the way. But through it all, Jesus is lovingly and patiently calling us to follow him. And that's a call I hope we always are drawn back to. Well, you've been listening to the Discover the Word podcast and a study called Answer the Call. Lisa Morgan, Bill Crowder, Daniel Ryan Day, and Rasul Berry have been your study partners for these conversations. Discover the Word is a small group Bible study from Our Daily Bread Ministries in Grand Rapids, Michigan, in which we invite you to walk with us through topics and passages that inform the way we read the scriptures, that challenge us as we live our lives as followers of Christ, and always point us to discover Jesus in the pages of the Bible. Well, over the years, we've heard from thousands and thousands of grateful listeners who are part of our discussions on Discover the Word. And as you know, these daily conversations are made possible because of friends like you. So please consider giving a financial gift in support of this ministry. Simply go to discovertheword.org and click on the Donate button. Thanks for listening. I'm Brian Hedding. Discover the Word is provided by Our Daily Bread Ministries. 